Hello and welcome to Winging It. So this video is the first part of a new series I'll be doing on this channel in which I take a look at the maths or math behind Wingspan. So wait, where are you going? No, don't close the video already. Come on, stick around. I promise this is going to be interesting and useful. So there's a number of different aspects of Wingspan that can be open to some mathematical analysis. And over the course of the series, I'll be doing a very basic look at this um, just to give a few tips and hopefully improve gameplay and scoring potential. So at its core, Wingspan is all about drawing bird cards and then gaining the food in order to play those bird cards and hopefully score some points from that. And at both stages of that, there's some element of randomness kind of baked into the game, whether it's taking cards from the deck or re-rolling dice in the bird feeder to get food, trying to understand these probabilities so you can weigh up levels of risk and reward uh, is so key to, to being able to improve your gameplay here. So in this first part, I'll be taking a look at the various hunting powers that you have in Wingspan. So depending on the type of power that it is, um, you know, where you are in the game, these powers have very different levels of hunting success. So, like I said before, being able to understand the probabilities of these um, and being able to understand what your expectation level should be in terms of point return can really help you decide you know, when's the right time to play this or when should I look to play something else. So there's two main types of hunting powers uh, in the base game at least of Wingspan. So there are those which tuck from the deck and there are those which reroll dice outside of the bird feeder. Now the key takeaway of this video is going to be that not all hunting powers are created equally. Uh, they function very differently um, and as you'll see over the course of this video have very different levels of success um, and really that's, that's key to understand so that you know which of these you should look to play and which you should look to avoid. So let's start by looking at the hunting powers which tuck cards from the deck. So in the base game these come in three different flavours. There are those which hunt less than 50 centimetres, less than 75 and less than 100. So pretty obviously the ones which hunt less than 100 centimetres are going to be stronger. You probably don't need me to tell you that. Um, just because there's more cards available that fit that criteria. Um, and generally you'll find that you know this stronger power is going to be reflected in either a higher food cost um, maybe a, a lower base point value or less nest spaces um, but it's kind of useful to understand you know is it is it worth that sacrifice you know how much more powerful are the stronger powers and is it worth sacrificing either paying more food or getting less points compared to the other birds that you could have played instead so if we take a look at this table this shows the percentage of birds in the deck which meet each of the different hunting thresholds. So this will give you a rough idea of the probability of success in each case for each of these powers. So as you can see, those powers which hunt larger birds are going to be more successful. Um, but really these numbers on their own don't tell us the whole story. You know, just seeing these numbers on a page, uh, it doesn't actually give us an idea of, you know, is it worth paying that extra food? or taking that lower point value um, just to play these birds. Um, and yeah, you know, these numbers, they're great, but they're kind of hard to remember. You know, in the middle of a game, uh, especially if it's a tournament game, it's a tense situation, there's pressure on my decision making, I'm not going to remember 56.7%. You know, I need something snappy and something easy to remember. So the way I remember these is just by rounding off and getting a very simple ratio. So instead of 56.7, I'm just going to round that down to 50%, call it 1 and 2. Then I can do the same for the other two, so 68.9%, I'll just call that 2 and 3, and 78.3%, that's 3 and 4. And that is just so straightforward for me to remember in a game. You know, all I've got to remember is 1, 2, 3, 4, and that is going to give me a really good estimate for how successful these powers are. You know, It's not going to be exact, it's not going to be precise, but in a small individual sample size of a single game, where you're really not going to be having too many attempts at this. You know, a few percent either way, uh, it's not going to make a huge difference. So just in the interest of ease of remembering, um, I think this is a really good system. 
um, and certainly one I would uh, encourage you to give a go and uh, yeah, try adopting that into your game. So the big question really is, what does all of this mean in the game? Well, suppose you're going to play one of these birds early on. You know, if you're building a strong grasslands engine around this, you know, maybe you've got some other point scoring birds, or, you know, birds that are going to give you resources, so you can run that grasslands uh, throughout the game. You can maybe expect to have 12 activations. You know, sometimes it might be higher, sometimes it might be lower, um, but just for the purpose of this basic analysis, let's stick with 12. So going through each of the three powers, you can see if it's one in two for 12 attempts, you're going to get about six. Uh, looking at two and three, you're going to get eight. And for three and four, you're going to get nine. So we can take a look at some example birds here. So we've got the Greater Roadrunner, we've got the Northern Harrier, and we've got the Peregrine Falcon. So each of these are the tucking powers, but you can see they have those three different thresholds. So we can take a look at these um, not just as their point value, but also incorporating this uh, expected return over the course of the game. So combining the two numbers, we can see for the Roadrunner, you're going to get 13 points on average, uh, 11 for the Harrier, and 14 for the Falcon. So even with that lower food cost on the Falcon, it's only costing two food as opposed to, to three for the Roadrunner, as well as that extra fle flexibility of, of going in a different habitat. Um, you're going to expect more points. You're going to get 14 instead of 13. Uh, but equally, you know, even that Harrier, you know, it's a much lower food cost. Only a single, a single food for that. Uh, but it's still keeping up relatively well. You know, only only two or three points behind. Um, and you know, early in the game, when food is precious, and it's hard to get hold of, that single food, you know, you can see there's still potential for for getting lots of points from that single food throughout the game. Of course, in the game. You know, which one of these you're going to play is entirely situational. It's going to depend which ones you draw. Um, it's going to depend on things like bonus cards. You know, maybe you've got the Omnivore Expert bonus card. So suddenly that Roadrunner is going to be worth a couple more points. Um, and it's probably going to be worth playing over these other birds. Uh, but I think, you know, having a, at least a basic understanding of these probabilities, remembering that ratio I was talking about, the 1, 2, 3, 4, just having that in mind it's not only useful for deciding which of these birds you might look to play, but it's also really useful at the end of the game. You know, if you're, you've got two or three turns left in the game and your key decision is, am I going to lay eggs or am I going to play some birds? You know, having a good understanding of, okay, I can expect 50% you know, success rate or 75% success rate for each of these powers, that is really going to help you decide what the best action is to take at the end of the game if you're going to maximise your score. So that's the first type of hunting power looked at. Um, now we're going to move on to the other type, which is re-rolling dice outside of the bird feeder. So these are a bit different in the sense that all the powers function the same. You know, you're always re-rolling a number of dice outside the bird feeder. But the strength of this power is going to change during the game, depending on how many dice you get to re-roll outside the feeder. So again, as before, we can get up a table that looks at probability of success. Um, but this time, like I said, it's not going to depend on what card you draw. It's all going to depend on how many dice there are outside the bird feeder. Now, what should be jumping out to you straight away is how much lower these numbers are compared to the previous table. So even in the best, most optimal scenario, you're only getting about 50% success rate, which is as good as the worst hunting power that we looked at before. So you know, really the key takeaway here from this whole video is that the dice rolling powers are much, much weaker than the tucking ones. And so really you should be expecting a lot fewer points from these birds. So as before, we can do some basic estimates for, uh, you know, how many successes you might get. So again, we'll look at 12 turns of activations. Uh, I'm going to be quite generous here in my assumptions. So, you know, I'm going to assume that there's always at least one die outside the feeder um, and I'm going to equally weight the chances of there being either one, two, three or four outside the feeder. So from 12 activations we'll get three activations with one dice, three with two, three with three and three with four. So running the numbers again we'll see that this spits out uh, an expected four successes over the course of 12 activations. So again it's going to jump out to you. you know, this, is, this is much lower than the numbers we were looking at before. 
Again here, we can make some really good direct comparisons. Um, so in particular, we can compare this power to the tucking power we looked at before. So here, if we look at the falcon that we looked at before and compare it with the ferruginous hawk, which is a rolling power. Now these two birds have exactly the same food cost, got the same nest type, uh, and they've got exactly the same number of egg spaces as well. So this is a really good comparison in terms of you know, I'm playing functionally the same bird for the same cost. How different is it going to behave over the course of a game? So even with that higher base point value, you know, you get one point extra from the hawk, you can see over the course of a game that falcon is going to catch up and overtake by a long way on that hawk. You know, only four successes on the hawk, but an expected nine on the falcon. So you're going to expect four more points from the falcon compared to the hawk. Um, and really, you know, if you if you haven't seen these numbers, if you don't have a good understanding of how these probabilities are going to work, you might lean towards playing that hawk instead because it's got that high base point value. Um, but you know, being able to understand this, you know, even under the most ideal circumstances, that hawk is not going to come anywhere near to the number of points you expect from the falcon. Now, I don't really have a good system for remembering probabilities here. Um, but to be completely honest, that's mostly because I just don't bother thinking about it. Uh, you know, my attitude towards these dice rolling powers is very different compared to the tucking powers that we looked at before. So with the tucking powers, you know, when I'm playing one of these birds, I'm expecting points, and I'm going to take that into account when I'm playing this bird. You know, if I'm playing something like the falcon, I'm going to take into account that I'm going to expect, you know, maybe around nine successes throughout the whole game. So I can look at that as a 14 point bird and kind of incorporate that into my plan into weighing up whether it's worth playing. With these dice re-rolling powers, I try to keep my expectations low. I focus more on you know these base points I'm getting, if it's got a nice nest type. You know, I think a really good example of this is the burrowing owl. So a lot of people are gonna recognize that the burrowing owl is not great because of that hunting power. Um, but it's still five points. It's got four egg spaces on a star nest. So if I've got good bonus card, Know, or there's multiple end of round goals that this is going to fit with. I'm going to focus more on that. You know, I'm not going to pay attention to the brown power. I'm going to look at how it's going to help me in other ways. If I do get some cash food from it at the end of the game, that's just a bonus. You know, if I get one or two, I'll take it. Um, I think if you go in with a bird like this expecting a lot of cash food, you're just going to be left disappointed at the end of the game when they fail to meet your expectations. So that's both kinds of hunting powers covered. Uh, in the base game at least. You know, there are some different types of powers in the expansion. Uh, and maybe I'll look at those in a future video. Uh, but hopefully you found this useful. Um, and yeah, hopefully you've been able to pick up some good tips just looking at the you know, the pros and cons of each of these types of powers. Um, and yeah, hopefully this will be able to improve your gameplay. So like I said before, this is just the first part of a series of videos in which I'll be looking at some different mathematical aspects of Wingspan. Uh, and if you are interested in that and want to keep up to date, definitely recommend that you subscribe to my channel. Uh, but otherwise, thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.